One of the ways of engaging the world of the text is by completing a word study. In this video, we're going to overview what it is we're looking for when we do a word study, and we're going to walk through one tool for completing word studies, namely stepbible.org. So when it comes to word studies, we are looking for a couple of different things when we do a word study. First, the words. Second, the definitions and the glosses of that particular word or words, and the uses of that word in a variety of different contexts. So when I say that we are looking for the words that are used, we are looking uh, not only for the word uh, in its Greek or verbal form, but we're also looking for the other one of those. So if we have, if we are doing a word study on a particular noun, we're also going to want to know the verbs that are sort of direct cognates of that noun and vice versa. So for most words in Greek, or at least most of the significant words in the Greek New Testament that one might do a word study on, you're going to have both a noun form and a verb form. That is not a strict and fast rule. You may in fact do a word study where you only have the noun or you only have the verb, but if there is both a verbal form and a nominal form, you're going to want to be on the lookout for both of those. And you're also going to want to be on the lookout for related words or phrases. This could be words or phrases that are often used in conjunction with the word that you are studying, or more commonly, it is going to be similar words. Uh, so if an author uses a particular word and there are several other words that are close synonyms or mean close to the same thing as that word, it's often significant why that author has chosen that particular word rather than the other ones. So knowing what words are closely related to a particular word that you are studying is really helpful for you to grasp why the author might be using that particular word at that particular place. We are going to use lex Greek lexicons, also, uh, also known as Greek dictionaries, to get definitions and glosses of a particular word. And a definition and a gloss are two different things. Uh, the word gloss might be a new word for you, but you can think of gloss sort of as translation. So a definition is going to be an explanation of a word, whereas a gloss is going to be an example or a translation of that word. So, for example, in Greek, oikos, a definition of oikos might be a structure in which human beings live. And then right beside that, you might have in italics something like home or house. So home or house is going to be the gloss or translation of oikos, whereas the definition is going to be the explanation of it. And both of those definitions and glosses are significant to look at when completing a word study. And when I say we are looking for the different uses of a word, there are a couple different ways that we are going to be engaging the ways that a word is used. First and foremost, we want to know how a word is used in a given biblical text. So if you are studying a particular passage and you're studying a word in that passage, you're going to want to know how that author uses the word in the passage and whether or not that usage lines up with how that author uses the word in other places in that same biblical book. Or do they defer in that particular location from how the word is more generally used by them in other locations? And if you're studying a biblical text that has more uh, an author that has written more than one biblical text, so for example, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, you're going to want to see if that author uses the same word the same way in different biblical texts. Does Paul use the word faith the same way in Galatians as he does in Romans? And then lastly, you're also going to want to see how different authors, whether they be New Testament authors or non-New Testament authors, that is to say uh, other Greco-Roman authors who are roughly contemporaneous with the New Testament authors, how do they use the word? Do they use the word in ways that are similar or different to the author that you are studying and to the uh, way that the word is used in the particular passage that you are studying. So to give us an example and to sort of walk us through how we might get some of this raw data or information out there, we're going to turn to John 3 once again and do a word study of the term world. And 
we're going to be looking for the words. We're going to be looking, I'm going to give you on the screen here some different glosses for the term world. And we're going to be looking at the way that the word world is used in different New Testament contexts. And to be able to get this information or to be able to get this data out, we are going to use a tool called Step Bible. So I'm going to move my screen over here. We're going to go over to stepbible.org. And I would invite you at this point to also open up up another window, go to stepbible.org and follow along with me. So not only will you be able to sort of perform these same tasks on a word that you choose to study on your own, but also so that you can explore Step Bible uh, a little bit more generally, uh, especially for those of you in the Greek exegesis class, you will find Step Bible to be a tremendous tool uh, for not only for your general exegesis, but also for uh, your Greek work in this class and beyond. So over at stepbible.org, the first thing we're going to do is let me highlight my cursor so you can see where it is. We're going to exit out of our Welcome to Step Bible, which is going to give you some basic information. And we're going to open up our passage at hand, namely John. Oops, excuse me, we're typing in Greek. Let's change that. John 3, 16 through 21. And then what we can do is we can uh, change our English translation and we can add uh, we can add the Greek text as well. So here you could do a translation comparison. We could pull up a number of different English translations to go along with the Greek. We can change the settings so that they are either top and bottom or they are side by side. Right now we're going to keep it with the ESV. One of the drawbacks of Step Bible is it doesn't have a a large, good variety of English translations. Uh, some sites like Bible Gateway are going to be a little bit better for doing a strict translation comparison. Um, so we're going to keep it with the ESV, uh, largely because the ESV is a tagged text in Step Bible. That is to say, when you hover over things and click on things, it's going to give you more information. But what we are going to do here is add in the SBL Greek New Testament to go side by side with our English translation from the ESV. And so here uh, we have our, our English on top, Greek on bottom. We're going to find an instance of the word world, for God so loved the world, here in John 3, 16. And you'll notice when I hover over it, it's going to highlight each instance of the term world in English and in Greek. So our nominative form of world is going to be cosmos. Uh, you're going to see a couple cosmon there in the accusative case. Um, and this is going to be true. It's going to highlight these no matter how large of a passage you have open. So if we had all of John chapter 3 open, it would highlight every instance of the term world in John chapter 3. And so what's so great about Step Bible with respect to word studies is that it does a lot of the work for you simply by clicking on the word. So you can click on it on, in English or Greek, and it's going to bring up this word analysis over here. It's going to give you a lot of different information, some of it the information that we are particularly looking for in our word study right now. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is scroll all the way down to the related words down here. We have a, uh, a verbal form in cosmeo, which uh, the um, gloss given here is to arrange. Cosmikos, an adjectival form, is going to mean earthly. And then cosmios, another adjectival form, is going to mean respectable. So these are going to be some of our related words, both in uh, verbal form and in adjective form. And then when we come up back up here, we're going to get our different um, definitions and glosses. Um, so you'll notice here that the glosses, that is the translations, have been put in, in bold. So we have uh, order, um, shamefully, in order, good order, good behavior. And so these are all also going to be arranged, I should note, um, by number. Um, so this is Roman numeral one, sort of one large definition with some glosses, uh, and then sub definitions under them when you have the numerals one, two, three, four. And then Roman numeral two is going to be another sort of category of how the word is used. Uh, so our Roman numeral two is going to be ornament, decoration, down to three, ruler or regulator, uh, number four, microcosm. 
Um, and then now down here at 4.3, we get the known inhabited world, uh, humanity in general, and 4.4, four, and 4.5, four, the world or the earth. And so you'll notice how the primary definitions and glosses of the word up here are not actually what we think of in the New Testament of the word cosmos. So in Greek 1, you learned of cosmos as, <clears throat> excuse me, earth or world as the primary glosses for that term. But in the sort of larger um, Greco-Roman world and the larger Greek language, cosmos, its first and prominent meaning wasn't actually world. This is actually something somewhat unique to, to the New Testament. And the reason that the LSJ um, gives these other ones first is because the LSJ, this is Liddell Scott Jones Dictionary or Lexicon, is primarily a lexicon for classical Greek, not Koine New Testament Greek. Um, and I'll show you in just a minute here that large, uh, this large lexicon that I suggested that you purchase, BDAG, is going to give us some more definitions that are sort of more New Testament and Christian oriented. Um, but so having looked at our different related words and our definitions and glosses, let's go ahead and go back over to our presentation here and get some of these out onto the table, get some of our data out there. So our words, we're gonna have cosmos, world, cosmeo to arrange, and cosmicos, worldly. So I've just sort of made a list of these here. Um, and here I wanna show you, before I put some of those glosses out here, here I wanna show you uh, the difference between LSJ and BDAG and sort of, uh, a, this is a very, you can consider this a very brief commercial for, uh, for that lexicon BDAG, that larger, more expensive Christian lexicon. Um, so, but what's great about BDAG is one that it's sort of oriented towards early Christian literature and the New Testament, but it's also really clear sort of in the way that it presents its uh, definitions and its glosses. And so here I've screenshotted the electronic version of BDAG that I used, uh, but I would say that actually in the physical version, the, um, the layout is even more clear than it is here. So I think one of the sort of uh, virtues of BDAG is that it is a very, it's a very well organized and very well laid out lexicon. And so we see that it's, um, we get some of those same definitions or similar definitions and glosses that we saw with LSJ. Um, adornment, adorning, number two, excuse me, let me highlight here orderliness, orderly arrangement, uh, and then third, the sum of everything and now, the world, the orderly universe. Moving down, we're gonna get even more, the sum of all things um, above the level of the animals, the world, that is sort of the human world, humanity, planet Earth as a ha uh, inhabitation, the world. So you'll notice here that we get the same glosses, um, but they sort of mean different things in the definition. Over to six, we have humanity in general. Again, the gloss of the world. Uh, number seven, the system of human existence and its many aspects. Again, the gloss of the world. And then eight down here, collective aspect of an ent entity, the totality or the sum total. So what's really uh, helpful here is to, to recognize that even though we have multiple uh, glosses or translations as the world, the world can mean different things. And one of the things that BDAG does is it gives you different texts, biblical or otherwise, in which uh, this uh, sort of definition uh, the editors think is being used in that particular passage. So if we were to look through here, we would probably find uh, John 3, yep, right down here, John 3, 16, um, as one of our instances of this uh, definition and this gloss for the world. So the editors think that um, that when John uses this word in John 3.16, John has in mind humanity in general and specifically all humanity, but especially believers as the object, objects of God's love. So that uh, God so loved the world, namely God so loved all of humanity, but God, is, God so loved especially believers. Um, so this gives us sort of specifics four particular passages that we might be engaging, and in this case, that we are engaging. So now that we've looked at both LSJ and BDAG, let's get some of our glosses up here. We have order, ornament, decoration, ruler, universe, earth, and humanity. Um, I should probably 
have put world up here as well uh, to go along with earth. And these are going to be our primary glosses when it comes to, to, um, to John. So having gotten words and glosses up here, I want to move us back over to Step Bible. And I want to show you another uh, another one of the sort of really powerful things about Step Bible. Actually, I'm going to show you two very powerful things. First, uh, first how we engage uses, and second, some ways that you might uh, engage the Greek um, with with Step Bible. So no, you'll notice over here in our word analysis, we also have a word count. So this word occurs about 187 times, and this is 187 times in the Greek New Testament. And when we click on this, what it's going to do is pull up every single instance of this particular word uh, using the same uh, translation parameters that we had initially set up. So in the SBL Greek uh, and then our ESV translation as well. And so from here, we can sort of look at how different authors use a particular word. So it's, this is going to be ordered canonically. So we're going to get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, we're going to get the synoptics first and then Johannine literature second. And I'm not going to go through and show us, uh, give us examples of how each author uses the word. I'll summarize that in just a moment. But one thing I do want to show you as you scroll down is that you can see uh, it doesn't take us very long to get through the Synoptic Gospels and then into the Gospel of John for this particular word. And then as we continue scrolling, we see that John uses this word quite often. About half of the uses of the word cosmos are in the Gospel of John. And then so we go down further and further, still scrolling through John, and we finally get to Acts, and then we can see how uh, how it's only used one time in Acts, and then we get to Paul, we can make some observations about how Paul uses uh, the term world, and then moving on into the later epistles, and then also into later Johannine, other Johannine literature, the Johannine letters, and finally down into Revelation, seeing the different ways that the term world is used. Um, and so I'm gonna move us back over and sort of my summary of how these different authors use the word. In the Synoptic Gospels, we really see them using the connotation of the word cosmos, uh, cosmos as the physical earth or the system of human existence, sort of humanity um, as it exists as a system. Um, and then Paul uses the word to really indicate humanity, that he doesn't have as much of a physical uh, earthiness um, to the term word, though he does use it that way sometimes, but primarily is using it for humanity. And the word in John, we find that it's most frequently in the New Testament used in John. Um, and that there's really in John sort of this, uh, oftentimes this hostility towards the world, or that the world is hostile towards God, Jesus, and those who believe in Jesus and are sort of uh, within the Jesus movement, or we might say the Johannine community, um, that you get this sort of uh, sense of almost antagonism between Jesus and the world, or the world towards Jesus, I should say. And so I told you I want to also show you something uh, sort of a powerful aspect of Step Bible with respect to engaging the Greek. So I'm going to go ahead and just start us over here and go back to John 3.16, or John, we'll just do John chapter 3 generally. And this time I'm going to remove the English translation altogether, pull up the Greek, And so a couple different things I want to show you here. So once again, when you hover over a particular word, it's going to show you where it shows up uh, elsewhere in that passage. So you notice if I pull up, if I hover over the verb apokrithe, um, we're going to get a number of different things here. So right away, you're going to get at the bottom um, some information about this verb, uh, not only as far as definition and glosses go, but you're going to get parsing information about the verb. And so I intentionally did not show you this tool in Greek one because I really wanted you to sort of work on the nuts and bolts of parsing and paradigms and those kinds of things so that 
you weren't using this tool um, as sort of a crutch early on. Um, I do encourage you to continue working with your vocabulary and your forms and not rely too heavily on this kind of thing as a tool because the more you rely on this, um, the more your Greek sort of um, goes by the wayside and you are heavily dependent on this as a tool. Um, but I do want you to be aware of it and I do want you to make use of it this semester. So it gives you all kinds of information, but you can also do other, um, other things with respect to analyzing the text. So if you were to click on um, these words, you're going to get that same sort of uh, word information that you did um, with what we just did with Cosmos. Uh, but a couple other things you can do here is you can uh, color code the grammar. And this is going to, uh, you can change your settings in different kinds of ways so that if you want to see um, particular forms of a word or partic particular uh, tenses of a verb. You can change all these settings and it's automatically going to color code this for you and sort of gives you a visualization of different aspects of the passage according to its grammar. Um, so as some sort of powerful tools there, you turn on this grammar button, it's going to tell you um, what the verb is, what the noun is, what the adjective is in a sentence. So it's really sort of starting to do some of that work of um, parsing out the different uh, parts of the sentence or almost diagramming the sentence for you here, giving you the information. And then when you hover over it, um, you can figure out what particular uh, case of a noun it is, or you can figure out uh, what particular tense, voice, mood, person, and number of a verb it is. Um, so giving you some of this sort of uh, Greek information in, in a really instantaneous kind of way uh, so that you can not only do word studies here, but you can also do grammatical analysis and you can get some help doing your translations through this tool. All right, I'm going to move us over back over to, excuse me, back over to our presentation here. And how I want to end this video is I'm going to ask you to summarize our work on the word uh, cosmos. Let's go back up really quickly. Um, so I'm going to ask you to summarize how cosmos is used uh, in this passage uh, given all of the data that we have put out there. Um, so go ahead and you can maybe pause here if you want to take a look at some of the data that we've gotten uh, gotten out there. And then when I when you unpause, I'll go back over to that next screen and I'll give you my summary of uh, how Cosmos is being used given the data that we've culled from Step Bible. All right, so I put it this way, I'm gonna read it, and this is how we will go out. In John 3, 16 through 21, the author uses the term cosmos four times in short succession. The word is a Johannine favorite, appearing 78 times total in the gospel. John, more than other New Testament authors, employs the word to distinguish between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, including especially the humans who inhabit it, namely the earthly realm. Often in John, the world, cosmos, is explicitly hostile towards Jesus and those who believe in him. So that's the context of the term uh, in the book at large. In this particular passage, the hostility is hinted at, but is not full-fledged, because it's the people who are in the world, not the world itself, who love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. <laughs> 